Great. Welcome everyone to the Identity Implementers Working Group call for May 5th, 2022. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Shar Howland and I'm a co-moderator of this group with Heather Dahl. Today we will plan to cover working group status updates and in the second half of the call, we will hear a presentation on the new did indie method from Daniel Bloom and Stephen Curran with time for questions at the end. And I'll, I'll work through the status updates slightly more quickly than usual to make sure we have plenty of time for the presentation. We also probably do have fewer updates than usual because of IAW, but I'll ask in a few minutes uh, if anyone on the call attended IAW and would like to share about their experience as well. As usual, this is a Hyperledger call. So we are following the antitrust policy and the Hyperledger code of conduct. We are collaborators in this space and anything confidential or proprietary is not dis discussed in, the, in this call. And of course, as usual, uh, let me know if you do have an interesting project able to be publicly shared that you'd like to talk about and you're very encouraged to reach out and give a presentation. We'll just schedule, schedule you in for a future call. This call is being recorded and it will be posted on the meeting page later today. And with that, we can move on to introductions. Uh, would anyone like to introduce yourself, yourself if you are new or rejoining or just would like to say hi and a few words about what you're involved in in this space? I'll also send out the wiki link again. Um, if you're willing to put your name under attendees, that would be great. All right, moving on to announcements. Uh, in three weeks, Indicio is hosting a meetup call that is very relevant to our presentation, presentation today. It is on the did indie method. Uh, this meetup will be longer than today's talk, so there will be an opportunity to go deeper and learn more. So if you are interested in what you learned today from Daniel and Stephen, you should definitely sign up for this meetup. Uh, the link is there to register. And then we've been announcing IAW for the past several weeks. It is now in the past. It happened last week and sounds like it was a great success. Um, did anybody who's on this call attend and would like to share a bit about their experience? I had a lot of FOMO. <laughs> yes, Just fear of know. missing out. <laughs> yeah. Sadness. I can, I can give like a, a quick overview of of some of my experiences at IAW, if that would be helpful. That'd be great, thank you. Um, so I had the privilege of attending IAW. It was great to be back in person. Um, virtual IAW was, was great to have. Um, and it, it was great to continue the momentum of the community even while we were unable to meet in person. But there's just something about meeting in person uh, that is just really difficult to replicate in a virtual setting. Uh, I think it must be just just the bandwidth that which we're able to communicate and just the the opportunity for the side conversations or the impromptu discussions just is greater than we had the opportunity for it in virtual IAW. Um, <clears throat> that being said, some of the, the big things that stood out to me uh, participating in IAW this year, um, there were some common themes that just kept on coming up. Um, one of those being machine readable governance frameworks, uh, which is something that Indicio has had a lot of opportunity to participate in. Uh, so it was, it was interesting to show up and, and have that be organically a topic that a lot of different organizations were talking about. Um, I think as the community is maturing, uh, we're all kind of reaching a point at, at more or less the same time where we're realizing that uh, decentralized identity gives us a cryptographic foundation of trust, but doesn't communicate real world trust. It doesn't help us to identify that this DID is this organization that is a valid issuer of driver's licenses, passports, or whatever. Uh, and so as a community, we're all kind of hitting the same point of uh, we need to be able to define what an ecosystem, what the participants in an ecosystem are, and, and what they're trusted for, and what roles they're expected to play. Um, so that was a really common topic uh, throughout IAW. 
Uh, and then we also, of course, had the common threads of interoperability, uh, how we reconcile quote unquote competing standards in the verifiable credential space. Um, kind of a, a, a highlight from a lot of those interop conversations is an acknowledgement from the community that we're not yet at a point where we feel it's appropriate to really rally behind one single implementation. We're at, we're at a stage in interop where there's still, uh, we're learning what different solutions are uh, appropriate for uh, different use cases. Um, there was a, an analogy to the browser interop days. I wasn't around for that. So I, I can't really communicate the analogy well enough to uh, uh, communicate the same meeting. So I'll just leave it there for now, I guess. Um, but uh, lots of con conversations about that and how we can do better at interoperating uh, with one of kind of the cool things that came out of that is a plan to do a bit of dog fooding. And for next IAW, just have everybody come with their credential systems in tow and uh, be able to use verifiable credentials at the door uh, to present our, our ticket to IAW and kind of use that as a interopathon, so to speak, on decentralized identity and verifiable credentials. Um, that's probably enough waffle for me, so I'll, I'll leave it there. It was really good, really glad to be able to participate and get back together in person. Great, thanks Thanks for sharing about your experiences and calling out those common themes. It sounds like it was a great success. Anybody else on the call attend who'd like to share about it? All right, are, are there any other announcements that anybody would like to give? All right, we can move on to working group status updates with that. The main identity working group, uh, we reported on their last meeting in our, our last meeting two weeks ago. So I'll leave those links up until we report on their next meeting, unless anybody's involved in that meeting would like to say a few words. All right, uh, indie contributors. Uh, Steven, since you're on the call, do you want to give a brief update on what we talked about in the, the Indie Contributors call last week? You got to remember. Okay. Uh, Mirko did his presentation. Um, I was hoping to hear, see exact examples, and I was uh, disappointed that we didn't have exact, exact examples of what it would be like to put other objects in did docs. And that's, I'm still looking for that. So I've got more queries out into the community to see um, what that looks like. If, if you're um, uh, referencing a, an object, a, a piece of data via a did, what does that look like? And has anyone actually done that? So we're looking for that. Um, we also talked about this proposal for DNS for a did indie um, namespace. And while we thought it's a reasonable idea, it's still uh, is, is just an alternative to the one we have. And we think it, it's not that um, strong an alternative or, or not that beneficial over the approach we're already taking. So we, I don't think there's any, a lot of further action gonna happen with that. So that's where we are with, uh, that's what we talked about on the Indie Contributors Call. Great, thank you for that update. Um, did Indie Method, just to reiterate that this call has been merged back into the Indie Contributors call, which has moved back to its regular time now that the work is done. And I've, I've left up the, the demo, the links to the demos from previous calls, but I don't think we need to say too much more about this here because we will hear plenty about it in the second half. Let's see, the Aries Working Group meeting. It, did anyone attend these? Latest calls would like to give an update. Uh, Aries Working Group. Um, we met yesterday. Continues, to, you know, lots of lots of interesting things going on. Um, the unqualified did. We're looking at a um, uh, Timo has done an RFC um, or a, a proposal for an RFC. Um, 
on on adapt ad, adoption of um, dealing with unqualified dids for how we will do that in the community community coordinated update. And um, we do have some information provided on um, the the problem of how you deal with um, present proof when you have when you're willing to accept a bunch of of different um, present uh, verifiable credentials uh, presentations from different verifiable credentials. That's the one and end problem. So um, more progress on all of those things. Um, there was a whole bunch of topics, and I, I, I can't cover all of them that we talked about on the Aries Working Group call, but it was very good. Um, Sam, as Daniel did, an excellent recap of IIW. Um, uh, so there's a bunch of good things on that call. Great. I don't have further details onto what other than what you have written there, um, but I think there was a few more topics on the one yesterday. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And there are links here to those meeting yeah. notes for more information. So thank you. All right, Aries Bifold user group. Uh, they didn't meet last week because of IAW. So we reported on their latest progress last time. So we can move on to Akapai. Uh, Stephen, I'm calling you out a lot. Would you like to yeah. jump in yeah. again? Sure. Um, this one, we had good conversations on um, release 074 with people volunteering and um being assigned um a few more things to verify and then we'll get the release out um, i think we're waiting for a bit of documentation now i expect it will be out by the end of the week so that's the final of uh release 074 we've had rc0 and rc1 release now this will be the final um ian costanza from BC Gov gave a presentation on the Aries endorser service, and that is um, uh, analogous to the Aries mediator service that we put out recently, which is basically a a repo that wraps uh, um, a you know provides a configuration of Aries Cloud Agent Python um, in this case to do endorsing of um, transactions for indie ledgers. So this makes it much easier to deploy um, an indie ledger um, where, uh, or, or sorry, an, 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 an Aries client, basically an agent that's perhaps an issuer or, or is an issuer and needs to have their transactions endorsed by a third party, whether it be an internal third party within the organization or an, ex an external third party. And so this will spin up an endorser service that accepts connections. We will extend that capability over time to include things like a user interface. So uh, the endorser service might get a request from somebody they've never heard of. So that'll go to a human to look at and decide whether they want to allow that the, the endorser service to endorse the transactions for that new uh, connection. So that's where we're going with that. So we had a presentation and there's a um, uh, a repo and a, and a HackMD document sort of describes the direction and we're looking for input and contributions to that one. And that will eventually go into uh, Hyperledger. Currently it's a BC Gov repo. Yeah, and I've linked the, the repo there. If, if you wanna drop the HackMD document in the chat, you're welcome to, and I can uh, add it in here. You have a uh, shot at that, yeah. Great, thank you. All right, let's see, Aries Framework Go. They've been, they've been meeting mainly going over work updates, but not too many notes from them. Um, let's see, Aries Framework JavaScript. And is anybody involved in this group who'd like to report? Looks like in their last couple of meetings, they've been mainly talking about supporting DidCom v2 in AFJ. I've linked a HackMD and Google Doc with more information on that. Then Hyperledger, Ursa, down here. Don't believe they've met um, since we last met. Are there other Hyperledger working groups or status updates that I'm missing that anybody would like to call out? One thing I wanted to call out that I, I realized um, in, I did the um, ARIES quarterly report. And one of the things I wanted to report on was a comparison um, between uh, the performance of 
in the SDK as underlying, um, in this case, Akapai agent and um, Askar, um, the, what is seen as the successor and um, found there's pretty amazing difference between the two. So um, a, a, a contributor in the community in, in, um, in Germany, Paul Wenzel, and team, I think um, working with IBM, I think he works, with, I'm not sure where he's, he is, I think he's with um, Lissy, um, worked with uh, IBM to create a, uh, a load test generator. So a whole environment where you can just create, define a load to run and run, you know, 100,000 issuances of credentials in an environment and it collects statistics on it and displays it. And um, I've got a couple of links that I uh, provided in the um, ARIES quarterly report to the, to the Hyperledger um, uh, Technical uh, Steering Committee. And um, I, I just hadn't realized the scope of the difference. So basically what you see is that um, double the performance in using the latest ASCAR, the O25, which we just added to Akapai, um, but more importantly, um, performance is consistent across the entire test, whereas with the Indy SDK, performance degrades over time. So basically the interactions get slower and slower um, on the, uh, versus ASCAR, which is absolutely constant across the entire test. And, and as I say, runs at, at twice the speed. So pretty impressive and, and very stark to see the two reports side by side. It's very impressive. So um, that's, uh, uh, that is an, basically a way of saying the O25 version of ASCAR is out, Aries ASCAR, which is the um, storage component of Aries agent that is um, the um, alternative to using the SDK, uh, the Indy SDK, and it's looking really good. And now um, we re we're certainly gonna push more and more to putting our implementations on top of that. Certainly all our new implementations will go on top of that. Thanks for calling that out. That's that does sound very impressive. And um, again, if you want to send out any of those links you mentioned, um, you're very welcome to. If people want to learn more, so thank you for that update. All right. At the Trust Over IP Foundation, they had their all members meeting the day before our last meeting. Kyle reported on that meeting in our last session and was one of the presenters. Uh, let's see, steering committee. As far as I can tell, they haven't met since our last meeting. Is anybody involved in the steering committee that would like to share about it? Or have additional information? Yeah, sure, with trust over IP. Oh yeah, you have it listed, uh, I see gain uh, below that, but that was a topic of the steering committee uh, kind of as a result of, uh, I guess, discussions at IIW, which I couldn't attend. But um, yeah, uh, it, it, along with, um, so GAIN and OIDC were, were both there and both interested in, uh, I guess, in discussing further with Trust Over IP. Uh, um, uh, I don't want to say ways of working together, but uh, yeah, um, uh, interaction points, let's say, something like that. And and I think part of it was um, uh, when um, Wen Jing was uh, presenting uh, uh, the trust over IP um, architecture stack that we've been working on that he's been spearheading. So um, anyhow, so the steering committee was, uh, uh, I guess one of the action items is to follow up with both GAIN and uh, uh, OpenID Connect and figure out how and how the architectures overlap and things like that. Great, thank you for that update. Let's see, and in the communications committee, it looks like they're mainly talking about an SSI adoption blog. Dan, are you also involved in that? Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I'm definitely involved in the communications committee. Um, the SSI adoption, uh, it's not ringing a bell. Um, with, uh, where's the line on him here though? Sorry. Um, oh, it just, yeah, it just has a link. I, um, yeah, I, 
there's there's so many things going on with SSI adoption. Uh, um, I know so I know one of the things we're working on is you know comparing it with the MDL and things like that. I'm, I don't. Uh, sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. I don't remember exactly. There was a series of blogs uh, we were going to do a neitis um, comparison, uh, an MDL comparison. So I'm not I'm not sure if this line item. Uh, SSI adoption blog is an overarching for those um, uh, for for those more particular ones, but I know that that those are in the works, the itis and uh, MDL. Great, great. Thank you for that update. Um, yeah, it sounds like there's a lot going on. And then we already heard about a bit about gain, um, which it sounds like the technology stack working group is working on as well. Let's see, Utility Foundry Group. Uh, Lynn, would you like to talk about what they're working on? Uh, yeah, so we didn't <clears throat> have a meeting uh, for the uh, the usual reason, I guess, IAW this last time. And so uh, there's nothing really new to say, but I'll remind everybody that we're working on a document that everyone's uh, welcome to uh, look at and review. The document uh, is nearing completion i think and uh we're it's essentially a a most of the the guts of the document are a rubric for determining uh whether a layer one public utility uh, or a an indie network essentially or whatever other kind of network you want to use is is suitable for your purposes so we're trying to help to 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 set the uh, the stage for helping people to determine which network they should join or whether, you know, in the end, if they don't want to join any of them to build their own. So, and that building your own is not covered in the document, but um, it will be in the next phase. So that's where we're at. Great. Great. Thank you for that update. All right. Ecosystem Foundry Group. Um, let's see. In their last video, they had a presentation on Check D from. Tobias Holleran. Um, for these last few TOIP groups, does anybody have any updates or anything they want to call out in general? All right, I'm looking at the time too. I might breeze a little bit more quickly through these last several working groups. Um, on the, the diff did come working group. Anybody attend this group who'd like to report? like they, as, as many of our groups have been um, reporting on IAW, going through PRs. Let's see, how about the unsync did come users group meeting? All right, and then some of these I don't think have met since we last met. Um, Sovereign Foundation, W3C standard. I think, yeah, a lot of a lot of groups have uh, skipped a meeting because of IAW. But does anybody have any updates I'm missing on the, the these last few groups in general or any any other status updates you'd like to jump in with? So I, I don't have a, a ton of detail on this personally, but uh, one of the sessions that was held at IAW <clears throat> was actually on a V2 of the W3C verifiable credentials data model, uh, which is seeking to overcome some of the shortcomings that were discovered in the V1, particularly as it comes to just being too open, too permissive. Uh, so it was difficult to actually produce things that are interoperable. Um, that was discussed. I, I believe Brent Zundel and others are working on putting together a charter to actually continue working on a V2 for the uh, verifiable credentials data model. Cool. Yeah, thanks for that update. All right, any last other working group updates or related matters? All right, thank you to everybody who jumped in with updates. It is very much appreciated. 
think we are ready to move on to the presentation portion of the call. We will hear from Daniel Bloom, who is a lead software engineer and team lead at Indicio. He's a veteran of the community who started at the Sovereign Foundation in 2018 and joined Indicio from its founding in 2020. He's a regular contributor on the Aries and Indy projects and spearheaded the implementation of the Indy did method that we're going to hear about in a moment. And Daniel also at one point led the identity implementers working group call. So it's great to have you back. And we'll also hear from Stephen Curran of Cloud Compass Computing. Um, Stephen is also a veteran of open source software um, and, and facilitating working groups in this space um, who dove full on into what has become the Trust Over IEP Foundation um, in 2017. Um, he works with the government of British Columbia and has helped define, build, and launch a variety of proof of concept and production applications built on verifiable credentials. Um, he's also a regular contributor in the Indie and Aries communities, facilitating collaborations and driving interoperability. Also is the, the co-author of EDX courses on Hyperledger Indie, Aries, and URSA, and is the current chair of the Sovereign Foundation. So with that, I will pass it over to you two. All right, do you want me to start, Daniel? Sure, do you have slides that you'd like to share? Or I can share a couple of slides, but I'm gonna be really short because you've got the good stuff. So all I'm gonna do cool. is put a bit of foundation on it to say you know, what BC Guy was looking for when we put this out, and what overall the did indie method is. So uh, just to provide that background. So did indie method, um, key user stories is I wanna be able to receive credentials from issuers using different indie networks and be able to construct a single and on-creds verifiable credential that uses all of those credentials. So that's a pretty straightforward thing. Issuers are gonna be on different networks. Um, I wanna be able to use any of their um, credentials that they give me in a presentation that I give to a verifier. Um, as well, a second one that we added um, into the did Indy um, discussion was being able to do publish a, a did doc such that I can have other information in it than the core information on Indy, such as a BLS key so that I can issue a W3C standard verifiable JSON LD credential using BBS plus signatures. Don't you love how long these user stories can get in when you talk cryptography and, and verifiable credentials? Um, uh, yeah, I'm just adding here or anything else that goes in a standard did doc. So, um, Part of the issue was, um, so the core problems were um, Indie identifiers don't reference what Indie network you're actually talking to, you're actually dealing with. So you get an Indie identifier, um, <clears throat> an identifier for a DID or an identifier for a schema. And, and by looking at the identifier, you can't tell what ledger it's on. And so you get an awkward user interface, like you see at the side here, where you have to, um, as a user, pick which network you think the issuer is using so that everything will work. Um, Lissy developed a parcel, partial solution, which has been adopted by a number of, of stacks, which is they just check all of them. They just say, oh, we're going to deal with all of these networks. And when you send us an identifier, we'll just check all of them. Now, of course, that's slow and um, subject to collision where you wind up with the same identifier on two networks um, and you have to figure out what to do with that collision. Um, but, but that's the core user experience problem we want to get rid of. And then as well, Indy does not have a native concept of did docs. Um, Indy predates the did spec and therefore, um, you know, has conventions for generating a did and a did doc or a did doc that is standard um, to the, or, or meets the standard, but, but predates it. So here are the five goals and, and what we're going to talk about. Namespace dids are useful across all instances. So when you look at a did, there's a component in there that says, oh, this is on the Indicio network. And, and you know to go there rather than trying a bunch of them and discovering that it's on in, in, in the Indicio network. So Indie network discovery and embedded in the did itself is the namespace. Um, full did doc support, 
we want to be able to provide a uh, allow a client to publish a did doc that meets the the specifications of of the did spec and can put as much or as little into that as they want um the names coming back to the namespace um piece um a non-cred uses a bunch of other objects beyond dids, not just dids, but schemas and credential defs and revocation registries. We want those also to be namespaced. And then um, there are several really important resolution uh, parameters that are uh, important for SSI. Um, things like version time, version ID, and, and resource. Basically, being able to look at history and say, yes, we know that did exists, but what did it look like on June 12th? 2021. Um, so you, you're able to, with those requirements, go back and see what they did look like at that time, not just the current version of it. And finally, we wanted to create a way to enforce or, or, or demonstrate that it did is self-certifying. Self-certifying basically means there is a direct tie, a, a, a calculable tie between the did and the public key for which it derived. So I, I create a, a key pair, a, a private key and a public key pair. I derive the did from the public key, and then I publish that. And anyone can, checking that can verify that the, the, the initial did itself derives from that first public key that was used for it. And this is an important um, property to proving that you control the did or, or that... Um, or, or that you're not just creating a, a did for confusion purposes or things like that, that you actually created it from the beginning. Even, even after you rotate it, this, this property can be verified. This was an important um, capability that was, was somewhat in the uh, original um, Indy implementation and definitely a core element of the carry um, protocol that's being used. So those were the goals. And with that, Daniel, now you got to, you did all the, real stuff. Um, and I, I should mention one more thing, sorry. Um, BC Gov put out a code, what's called a code with us, which is we said, hey, we need these things. Community, can you do this? And we put, um, and the government put a sum of money uh, for it. And um, that's how this work came about. So huge kudos to um, BC Gov for creating a program that allows for open source um, um, challenges to be put forward. And basically the way it works is um, the government defines a goal that it wants. Um, people or organizations apply and, um, and in order to be paid, they need to do a merge that, that um, we agree meets um, the intent, the goal of that, um, uh, of that. And so it's a very low, um, um, low overhead program, fantastic, and has really worked well in this space um, for BC Gov to get to get things done. Um, in this case, Indicio and Dominic Werner won it, and um, um, Daniel will talk about what came from winning that. And Lynn's got a question. Sorry, just the an, an add-on. Maybe you, you mentioned this, but I, there's a place where the um uh, sorry the genesis files are being stored for networks and so the the screen you showed where currently that you have to you know each app would have to contain uh you know whatever networks they trusted or listed or whatever that is is not going to have to happen in the future if you if you get a new name you can go look in a common place and grab the Genesis file and, and make it work is the, is the goal there. I thought that was it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. So that's the, um, the discovery. So not only do you have the namespace, the, the ledger in the identifier itself, but there's a mechanism defined that the community agrees to, to say, oh, I can go look up this name, find the Genesis file and use it dynamically. So that's another feature that's um, been implemented. Um, that was in the work, uh, in the VDR work that Dominic did. And with that, go. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for kind of leading into it. That was a really good introduction to all of what we've been working on recently, I'd say. And, and thank you, Lynn, for the addendum there as well. Um, so 
I'm going to talk about the Indy did method, getting a little deeper than Stephen did. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and hop right into it. Um, so a lot of this background, uh, Stephen's already covered, so I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, Indy was around before. Uh, we had NIMS and attribs versus dids and did documents, and there's been this dissonance between uh, what Indy is doing and what the W3C did core specification has been working on. And then we, of course, have the uh, uh, this uh, the assumption that there would be only ever a single Indy network just didn't occur. Uh, and so being able to work with multiple Indy networks and uh, you know issue from one network, verify from another, uh, and use a variety of networks to accomplish our goals in decentralized identity is, is something that is both really valuable for interoperability, but just also allows us to um, use networks for what they're specialized to, uh, to do, I guess. Uh, what framework or jurisdiction that they reside in uh, and kind of use that uh, to help bring verifiable credentials and, and interoperable decentralized identity to a larger audience. Um, so these are almost exactly the points that uh, Stephen brought up as well. I'm going to dig into each of them one at a time here <clears throat> and talk about some of what we have done with the Andy did method and, 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 and in implementation. Man, get those words out uh, to accomplish it. Um, so first up, natively supporting DIDs and DID document semantics as defined by the W3C DID core specification. Uh, so we now explicitly have within the DID indie method rules for transforming the core NIM information into a base DID document. Uh, so inside of a NIM transaction, this is very much uh, shortened just for brevity. Uh, we have multiple attributes inside of a NIM transaction, but the key ones for this purpose being the DEST or the uh, method specific identifier value that you would include inside of a fully qualified DID. And then the VER key, uh, which is the public key currently associated with that NIM or that destination uh, identifier here. So the did ND method defines that these values, uh, this DEST and VER key, becomes uh, a DID document that looks like this. So we've got the ID of did Indy and then the namespace of the network that we're resolving the did from, and then that destination value, uh, at, and then a verification method, uh, a single verification method just included by default, uh, associated with that destination with the fragment of Verki as the ID, this is an ED25519 verification key uh, with a public key base 58 value corresponding to that original very key value here. And then the controller as defined by the did. And then also an authentication block which references that verification method. So this is the base DID document that can be constructed from all NIM transactions on an ND, on an ND network. Uh, we also have defined rules for merging in a new attribute uh, associated with NIM transactions, the did doc content, uh, that is merged with that base DID document. Uh, so as before, we've still got that dest and ver key attributes inside of the NIM transaction, but we've also added this did doc content attribute, which contains a serialized JSON value, which might look something like this. So this particular did doc content is saying add on these JSON LD contexts or uh, you know just the did core context and then a didcom messaging service endpoint context and also include uh, a service endpoint for did communication uh, which has a recipient key pointing to the very key that is contained in the core did document and no routing keys in this endpoint and so on. So the rules as defined by the ND did method um, outline that the base did document and that did doc content get merged into uh, this value here. This is a little small. This is an image uh, of an example taken directly from the ND did method specification. Uh, but if we inspect it here briefly, we should see all of those pieces that we saw in both the base and the did doc content merged together into a single value. Uh, so the ID, of course, the did ND namespace and then that method specific identifier, the verification method, um, which has that 
uh, fragment of Berkey and the base 58 encoded value um, for that key, that authentication that hasn't gone anywhere. And now we have also this service block, uh, which includes that recipient key, service endpoint, and all those values that were defined inside of the did doc content. Uh, and then of course, also the did doc context that was included in the content. Uh, so this has a number of other really useful characteristics. Um, it means that we can fully resolve the DID document from an ND network with just a single transaction, uh, as opposed to doing a NIM followed by an attrib, which was the previous mechanism for resolving endpoint information associated with a DID on an ND network. Um, we've more or less deprecated this usage of attribs, um, but we are continuing to support uh, the ability to look up the attrib transaction on ND networks. This is a fully backwards compatible change that has taken place. So using this did doc content attribute, we can write any arbitrary did doc value into an ND network uh, DID. So like Stephen was mentioning, uh, we can now include BLS keys. So we can include uh, BBS plus signatures from ND based DIDs. Uh, also allows us to use other key types as well, not necessarily BLS, uh, things that were previously not really things that we could add into an ND network. Okay, so next on the list of things uh, was supporting those key resolution parameters. Uh, we've got version ID, version time, and resource. And as Stephen mentioned, these allow us to look up a value of a DID at some point in the past. So what did document values were uh, associated with the DID on June 12, 2021, um, or at a specific ID. So uh, the didND method specifies version ID as relating to a sequence number, uh, which is an, a unique incrementing integer that is uh, a reference to a transaction on an ND network. So version ID in the W3C did core specification gets mapped to a sequence number which is included in a get name transaction. So under the covers, when we dereference de um, or resolve uh, this did ND sovereign ABC123 with version ID 789, uh, the resolver is transforming this into uh, a get name request with a sequence number of 789. Uh, in a very similar manner, uh, if we have a version time, uh, this, oh, I've actually, Got a typo here. The version time is actually an ISO formatted date time. Um, and then the resolver takes that value and then transforms it into a POSIX timestamp, which is what is natively supported by ND networks, and then does a similar get name transaction to the network uh, to retrieve the DID document at that point in time. Uh, and then that resource parameter is mapped to a get transaction request on in networks. The next on the list, we've got to find did URLs to dereference a non creds objects in a ledger agnostic way. Um, this is, of course, only defined for the indie did method, but it leaves the door open for other uh, did methods to resolve these sorts of objects in a similar manner, uh, just by defining the semantics of dereferencing one of these did URLs. Uh, so this did URL uh, looks something like this in a very abstract form. We have the did followed by a slash, followed by the object family, uh, the object family version, the object type, and then an object type identifier. Uh, if you're familiar with the didcom space, this might look familiar, I guess. Uh, we followed a similar set of uh, motivations to arrive at a namespaced and then versioned object uh, that allows us to, you know, at some point down the line, define a different uh, version or whatever for resolving a non-creds object. Uh, so as an example of what these did URLs look like, uh, previously, when resolving a schema from an indie network, this is what the identifier would look like. Uh, this corresponds to the author of the schema. Two represents that this is a schema uh, the NTDB is the schema name, and 4.3.4 is the schema version. Using the did URLs, we have did colon indie colon sovereign colon 
the did, followed by a slash, followed by a non creds, v0, schema, uh, where schema is the object type, npdb, which is again the schema name, and 4.3.4 as the schema version. Uh, and we've also got a similar mapping that takes place for uh, credential definitions or claim definitions and re revocation registry definitions as well. Uh, just again, same pattern of did author. Uh, this is, represents a claim def. This represents the signature type. CL is the only signature type currently supported by a non-cred. So this is actually omitted in this specific uh, version to non-creds did URL reference here. Um, the sequence number corresponds to the sequence number of the schema on the network, and then a tag for the credential definition. Uh, this is a good time to call out that um, in this v0 non-creds did URL reference format that we've established, uh, we are uh, looking forward to a time where we can reference schemas for a credential definition that resides on a ledger separate from the one where the credential definition is defined. So suppose we have a schema on sovereign mainnet uh, for a driver's license schema. Uh, we could use that schema on an Indicio network to define a credential definition uh, for my issuer, which is anchored to an Indicio network. We're not yet to that point. Uh, that kind of has some tie-in with the non-cred standardization efforts, which are occurring in parallel. Um, but we've, uh, again, by versioning these did URLs, we leave the door open for down the line saying in a V1, rather than doing a sequence number, referencing a transaction on the same ledger, uh, we can have uh, another identifier which points to another network uh, for that schema. Uh, let's see. So at IAW, actually, uh, as a, a brief tie-in, uh, the semantics of did URLs were, were discussed briefly with uh, uh, Marcus Sabadello, who's been kind of the pioneer in the did resolution and uh, URL dereferencing space. Um, and it was really interesting having conversations with him about the did indie method and uh, the example of using paths in did URLs as a mechanism to reference objects on a ledger associated with a DID that isn't a DID document. Um, to my knowledge, I think we're the only did method that is currently doing this. Um, but using Marcus's words here, just to, to brag a little bit, he said this was a very appropriate usage for the path of a did URL, even though it's not widely used yet. And I, he expects that this could be a very clean mechanism for referencing these sorts of objects on other did methods as well. So one day down the line, a, you know, did BTCR could reference uh, non-creds objects written to that ledger using a similar path mechanism. Uh, and then it's just up to the dereferencer to use whatever mechanism specific to BTCR to resolve an non-cred schema or credential definition. Cool. Uh, so then the final uh, bit to talk about here, defining unambiguous network identifiers. Stephen covered this and Flynn did some covering of this as well. Uh, we want to be able to say which networks we're aware of um, and have the opportunity to dynamically discover new networks. Uh, so a particular client of indie networks can use a static definition where uh, the client is just configured to quote unquote know about a set of indie networks. Uh, you might consider this as being part of a machine readable governance framework as an example, uh, or it could just be built into an app directly where it just says, I know about Indicio, I know about uh, Sovereign, I know about ID Union. Um, and this would just be lumped in as a static definition of the networks that and namespaces that we're aware of. Then we can also do dynamic discovery of new networks. Um, so the uh, best example we've got of this right now is the Indie Did Networks re GitHub repo, which is just a really lightweight way of essentially having a registry of these network namespaces and associated Genesis transactions so we can um, interact with those networks. Um, 
yeah, I don't think I have too much more to say on that. Uh, so we, we don't necessarily see ND networks being as frequent as hundreds or thousands. Uh, so having a, a lightweight mechanism such as this GitHub repo to discover new networks for the hundred or so that we anticipate uh, is a, at the moment, a, a favorable solution for this dynamic discovery. So to briefly talk about what, what's been going on on the did method work. Um, so as Steven mentioned, we did the BCGov code with us and DCO and Dominic Werner were awarded the code with us. And we at Indicio worked on the Indie node side of things, so the network side to add support for the Indie did method. And Dominic worked on the Indie VDR or the resolver side uh, to support Indie did method and providing that uh, uh, kind of generic resolver interface. Um, don't have enough time to really get into exactly what those changes look like. So I've just got a brief overview here. There were additions to the NIM transactions, as I've previously described. We added that did doc content, we added a version which ties into the self-certification uh, feature that Steven described as well. Uh, we added the ability to do that sequence number and timestamp resolution for GitNim, as well as get a trib for that legacy support. On the NDVDR side, uh, those additional optional parameters for the doc content version, sequence number and such were added to the requests and builders for those requests. Uh, the resolver interfaces, so taking a did ND did and turning that into a did document that, that all took place inside of the NDVDR, um, as well as updating the proxy service that's in, in the NDVDR uh, repo, uh, which provides um, a, a web service that can be used to resolve these DIDs and then updates to the Python wrapper. So that was a very high level overview of the Indie did method, the current work that's been going on. So what comes next? Um, first, we'll need a release of uh, Indie node and Indie VDR that includes all these changes that we've made. Uh, and then after we have a release, ledgers will need to be updated to uh, run this new software. And then after that, we need agents as well to be updated to support these uh, unambiguous identifiers within a non creds objects. Um, so we, we anticipate that work will take place inside of it, the Indie CredX libraries and other shared libraries um, to add that support to agents at a lower layer so everybody can benefit from it. Um, specific agent implementations can also uh, work directly with whatever libraries they choose to add support for that. At this time, we currently don't have scheduled any changes for the Indie SDK. Um, if you're interested in getting involved on that front, we can certainly help guide that effort. Uh, but we and currently really only have scheduled the shared library uh, work for these updates. Uh, let's see, I, I've included some links here. I'll make sure a link to this presentation is available. I've also got more content after what I planned to present today, if you'd like to dig in a little bit more on your own time. Um, and yeah, I think that about covers what we're able to cover for today. Um, if you'd like to learn more, uh, we are holding that meetup at Indicio to dive in a little bit further into the nuts and bolts and what we see as the impl implications of this work. So really interested to get your input and feedback and participation in that meetup. Um, but aside from that, I'm, I think I'll leave it there and uh, see if anybody has any questions for the last few minutes. Thank you for that presentation, Daniel and, and Stephen. That was a great overview. Um, what, what would you say are the implications of this project for scalability and interoperability of Indie networks? Incredibly important. <laughs> um, it, it's it's um, scalability and I think as well governance. I think that's the important thing is issuers, different, different categories of issuers will want different um, guarantees, if you will, from, from their layer one utility, as it's called in trust over IP for where they put their information. And this allows them a whole lot more control to be able to do that. And that's, that's really important. Um, 
uh, you know, from a scale perspective, it, it allows us to easily use, you know, spin up networks or use networks and not force the, um, the, the holder or the verifier to have to pre, um, preload everything. Um, so that gives us scale, it gives us more capacity on the networks. Um, and then as I say, this governance factor as well, all important. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I second what Steven said there. The, the interesting thing to me um, as well with the data indie work is that kind of paradoxically by improving the indie networks, we, we've almost in a sense made it easier not to use indie networks and still maintain the same privacy preserving nature of the non-creds. It's in the future, it'll be a bit before we're, we're really at that reality. Um, but at the same time, by making the non-creds more interoperable, uh, by making it more accessible, we're also strengthening the case for any networks themselves as a really good solution for your jurisdiction, your uh, private network that meets your governance use cases and needs. And so uh, that, that's part of what gets me really excited about uh, uh, the IndyDid method. Yeah, it's definitely a significant update. So thank you. Yeah, I, I'm going to second that what Daniel said and 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 highlight that that pathing that was mentioned about how you reference other objects. Um, Daniel put it well in the presentation, and and people should highlight that that that's really important. Now, now we have a a way to reference these objects that are that are indie specific um, right now, but could be put on other networks and and that work was was pretty crucial and as he mentioned um, um, uh, Marcus's blessing of it if you will for sure great are there any <clears throat> other questions for Daniel and Stephen before we wrap it up all right I will make sure that the, uh, the link to these slides get, goes into the meeting page. Um, looks like we are at the top of the hour. So thank you so much everyone for joining. Thanks to everybody who jumped in to give updates from working groups. And thanks again to Daniel and Stephen for their presentation. Thanks, Char. Thank you.